Greetings, aviators, and welcome back to Wings Up Week, day four. I'm Russ Still, and this is our virtual celebration of general aviation brought to you by Gold Seal and Safe. And we're proudly sponsored by Uncle Dusty's Homeopathic Water. Our Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday shows are all archived on YouTube, so if you missed one, we've got you covered. Just search on YouTube for Gold Seal, and we'll be the first thing that pops up. We've had a wonderful group of guests so far, and these are some of the people you might have seen had we all been at Sun and Fun this year. We've had Brian Turner, Rod Machado, Flight Shops, Josh Flowers, Chris Palmer, the world's most savvy flight instructor, Greg Brown, and a bunch of other great folks. It's been so much fun, I can hardly stand it. And we're still looking forward to having Tom Turner on tomorrow. And for today, Steve, Flight Shops Thorn, returns, along with our frequent contributor, Patty Wagstaff. Now, my friend, mentor, and executive director of SAFE is in the right seat today. So, Dave, how about it? Hey, Russ, thank you. And, uh, yep, we're here. I don't know if I'm uh, taking instruction or giving it, but uh, here with you. And it's a great show we have lined up for you today. Okay, well, we'll do the obligatory weather report. Again, another beautiful day here in Atlanta. It's about uh, maybe 70 degrees outside, sunny. So it's a beautiful day. What you got up there in New York? Uh, it's actually rainy in about 36. It's kind of miserable, I got to say. No champ weather mm -hmm. today. <laughs> so anyway, to be here, um, not up there. So I guess we're focusing. Had we on been in Sun and Fun, things. Had we been at Sun and Fun, things would have been a lot different. It would have been plenty hot down there. But, you know, had we been at the booth, we would have been signing up people for SAFE. And once again, I invite people to go to safepilots.org and check out SAFE. If you're a flight instructor, it's a wonderful organization. Uh, Gold Seal would have been there right next tour. We would have been handing out some of these flyers here. And just once again, I want to tell people about them. We were going to have a special a uh, discount code for Sun and Fun visitors, SNF20, SNF20. Now that was going to save $20 off on our Gold Seal Ground School product. That's at groundschool.com. But we've doubled it because of the circumstances. Give everybody a little uh, less expensive route into aviation training. So SNF20 will save you $40. So what about SAFE? Well, we got a lot of things for you, and I think our focus here this uh, before we bring on Steve and Patty are to do a little bit of tools and takeaways. One of the things we have that just dropped was a, um, a East Coast IFR that Doug Stewart had done a couple of years ago with Billy Winburn, and I don't know if you can put up that first slide, but it's available now on Community Aviation. And what they did, uh, because they want to get these starting to roll out, is they knocked uh, 70, I think it's $77 off. The, the selling price is 78 So if you go to communityaviation.com, you'll see this. And basically, Doug Stewart has flown this for years down the East Coast. I think he charges like ten grand by the time you're done. And you go all the way to Miami. You shoot approaches all the way down the East Coast. And then you come up through the mountains, go all the way up to Maine, and then back to Columbia County. And I think it takes five or seven days to complete this whole route. Um, but what Billy did was he put a videographer in the back seat, and they shot every approach, and then they uh, codified them. They have the uh, actual approaches there for you to fly. They even put a few of them on the Redbird so you can try them for yourself. So the course is quite reasonable. And, uh, you know, we just figured with everybody sitting and not being able to fly, why not uh, discount this since it just dropped into our lap? So uh, if you go to communityaviation.com and you check it out, you'll, you'll see that offer. The other thing on Community Aviation, if you take a look, is you will see the uh, Proficiency 365. And if you're familiar with that, this started way back in 2008 when the Redbirds first started coming out. Uh, Doug Stewart had one at Sun and Fun in 2008, 2009. And the idea was to create scenarios that would challenge the pilot um, because it's very hard to surprise yourself in a simulator. So we created these with a decision tree. If you go one way, you're going to get go the other way you continue. And these scenarios are all online at Community Aviation. Um, they're now part of the uh, EAA Proficiency 365 program. And there's a whole network of Redbirds all over the country where you can fly these and get wings credit. 
You can also fly them on your own Redbird with an instructor and get wings credit. So it's a wonderful way while we're not actually flying planes to get in there and maintain or improve your efficiency and proficiency. Um, part of what we want to do today is try to cover some of these tools that will move you up in, instead of everyone getting rusty while we're waiting. Yeah, Doug Stewart is absolutely one of the best instrument instructors around, and he's been doing this uh, East Coast uh, trip for, like you said, a long time. But I can't imagine a better person to put together a, a set of videos, so I would strongly recommend people take a look at that too. Now, you and I had talked, uh, Dave, about discussing proficiency and people's ideas about uh, what's, what's proficient and what's not. Um, one of the things we talked about, and you and I have talked about this many a time, is this concept that people are getting ready for written tests, whatever they are. 70% is a pass, uh, what you call the last guy in medical school, he's still a doctor. Another 70% is, is perfectly good. Anything other than that is wasted effort. And I'm, as you know, I strongly disagree with that because I think there's a reason. It's, it's not that people are trying to pass a test. The test is just to make sure that you did the study. And let's face it, if there was no knowledge test, people wouldn't even do the book study. Few would, but most wouldn't. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And if you could put up that slide we have there, Will, um, as a pilot examiner, uh, somebody can get a 70 on a test and they're totally qualified for that certificate. So this dude, um, you know, older fella, wanted to be a ground instructor, took the test. He gets a 70 percent on it. When he walks into any DPE with this knowledge test, our obligation from the FAA is to issue a advanced ground instructor certificate. Um, and it means he qualified as a advanced ground instructor, but obviously you can see all the test codes there of things that he got wrong. There's 30% of this subject that he obviously doesn't know. But in the FAA's pass fail mentality, he is now a ground instructor. And this is true also in pilots. When we do a flight test, if somebody meets the standard, if they're absolutely mediocre on every subject area, they're still gonna qualify for that certificate. And this is probably one of the things you don't realize about examiners is um, it's a bad day when somebody just struggles through that test, every item is just mediocre and they kind of fall over the bar and our obligation is to issue a pilot certificate but there's nothing that addresses that uh, delta there between uh, mediocre and really excellent. And if you ever wonder why Gold Seal and Safe are bonded at the hip for shows like this, it's because Russ and I absolutely agree on this concept of every pilot should be pursuing excellence. And as we discuss this program today, it really became obvious we have Flight Chops on and we have Patty Wagstaff, two people who really embody excellence. They really, you know, Patty didn't get to be three-time aerobatic pilot, um, you know, um, by just, you know, showing up. She is probably the most aggressive student in the world, works herself harder than anyone you know to, to achieve that high level of performance. And when Steve started to launch his videos online, I, I remember just seeing this Super Cub video and I said, you know, here's a guy in a Super Cub, another YouTube. But then I heard the guy saying, boy, I really didn't do that well. I could have done better there. I could have, you know, he's probably one of the guys that's the hardest on himself of any pilot I've seen. And he just pursues, you know, excellence. So both Russ and I are, are really advocates um, of that kind of approach to flying. Yeah, I was having a discussion with a CFI on Facebook just right before the show, and I even gave her the link, and I hope she's watching. I'm not going to say her name. But uh, she was talking about this concept of where she thought 70% was adequate because that's what the FAA just finds as a pass. And this is what she said. Uh, she's talking about the knowledge test, and she says, for many people, it's an obstacle, and it doesn't teach you skills and procedures and decision-making that will keep you alive in an emergency. It doesn't teach you how to fly the airplane. While it's important knowledge, there's, there, the FAA has these standards for a reason. A 70 is just as good as 100 and is still eligible to take a check ride. And that just, those are the kind of things that just really keep me up at night when instructors kind of tell their students that there's no reason to try to achieve excellence, just, just do enough to get the certificate and go on. And I also disagree that studying 
will not do anything to help you with your decision making. Uh, Gold Seal's been taking a, a program around, a, a really nice seminar for about six months now on engine failure after takeoff. And so many people think that the, uh, this is all a kinetic thing that you learn. It's all a stick and rudder skill, but it has so totally wrong. You have to understand the, the concepts, the physics behind it to actually make this thing work out. So we took all sorts of case studies, we broke them down, and really this seminar is all about getting material in your head. Uh, it's not just about stick and rudder. So again, instructors, I hope you will start for those of you who don't, you know, really look at knowledge as an important piece of the puzzle for de developing new pilots. Yeah, absolutely, Russ. Um, I'm so disappointed that you weren't able to give that. I was going to be the big stage on the uh, Sun and Fun Forum, and I was really looking forward to seeing that because I know after we did the live stream, you continued to develop that and uh, really dug into it. And I was discussing with you every time in the 135 environment, when we take off, we're required to give a contextual briefing on if something happens here, we'll do this. If something happens here, we'll do that. And it's all based on the field we're on, the weather, the conditions, the pilots. Um, and 24% of fatalities are on takeoff and initial climb. And when I talk to private pilots, they're like, well, it's pretty hard to miss the sky, but Obviously, there's so many challenges there if something happens that people do mishandle it. So um, being mentally prepared, having the knowledge is critical. And obviously, that is one of SAFE's uh, chief missions. We're directed at CFIs primarily because exponentially then we reach every pilot with uh, knowledge and excellence. I'm going to talk about a few quick tools and then we've got a, another slide to come up. But SAFE has an app, which is free to any CFI, um, that's um, CFI Toolkit. And if we were at Sun and Fun, the other thing that we would be doing, Russ and I, is any CFI can join Gold Seal for free. They have a portal that puts a CFI on there. You can get a curriculum. If your students join, you can track them. Um, it's probably the best online tool you've ever seen because it was the very first one that uh, ever was developed. And Russ has continued to tweak this and develop it and perfect it. It really is a, you know, he's, he's developed the, he, when he gets a new toy, he always shows me, did you see the 3D animation, how we do airspace now? He just continues to improve because he is a guy that pursues excellence. Um, and I'm going to embarrass him one more time and say, you know, a guy with a successful online ground school doesn't have to do this, but he just renewed his master instructor um, certification. So whether you know it or not, after an instructor gets certificated, um, all they have to do is a quick FERC every two years and they're re-certified uh, as a flight instructor. But people who really pursue excellence continue and get that higher level called a master flight instructor, which uh, Joanne and Sandy Hill developed. So um, I think Russ is what are you, eight or nine, Russ? Uh, just did number eight. I think maybe when I get to 10, I'll retire. <laughs> but yeah, it it's a great program and it forces, it forces instructors to actually get out there and do a little bit more than just get in the airplane and, and log hours doing flight instruction because it does require you to create, write articles, develop instructional materials, find new ways to do knowledge transfer. And for me, that's what it's all about is knowledge transfer. Dave, let's break up this, uh, this heavy subject for just a minute. And let's do a giveaway. Have you have got any more caps over there at SAFE? Yeah, we'll absolutely do some hats. Okay, Am we'll give away one of our uh, gold seal. Yeah, no, you're, you're there. Uh, we've got some cool t-shirts. We would have been giving them away this week at Sun and Fun. And because we're not there, we're gonna give them to you right now. So it's got this great watch for low flying aircraft sign on the back. A lot of fun, good attention getting thing. Now we are going to put a picture of an airplane and this is the first one in the list for you guys back there in the booth. Uh, we're gonna show this airplane and we're gonna give you a phone number. And tell me if that's not how we're still gonna do it. <laughs> for the fourth person who, answer, who makes the call, you will get a chance to tell us what kind of airplane this is. If you get it right, you win a t-shirt. If you don't, we'll take one more call and have one more person try for it. So that phone number is 888-514-1945. Uh, I apologize that we don't have the... 
Option three, thank you, thank you. So 888-514-1945 and pick option number three. So let's put that picture up there again and we'll leave it up a little bit while we uh, blab on and wait for some lucky person to get a, a t-shirt and a cap. Great for summer weather when you're out in your yard all by yourself. Good for, it's a good quarantine uh, uh, outfit. So this was actually a, a beautiful airplane, unfortunately. Uh, they didn't perform as well as was hoped, but boy, what a great looking, great looking airplane. Uh, we're also going to be giving away some more t Okay, all right. Thank you, Will. Whenever you hear me talk to somebody, it's, uh, I'm not uh, hallucinating. It's uh, the guys in the back telling me what to do. All right, so Dave, we're going to wait and get a, see if we get some phone calls on that. Uh, what else can you and I talk about to burn a, just a couple of seconds here and let some phone calls come in? Any more material about SAFE and the Master Flight Instructor Program? I will like to say, uh, oh, let me say this. Thank you for pointing out that Gold Seal does allow instructors to join the program for free. And what this means is instructors can sign up for the ground school, full access, nothing's held back, no cost, it's good forever. And when their students sign up, they've got a My Students page. They actually are linked to all their students. They can track all their progress. They can communicate with them through the program. They can integrate their own flight training with their ground program. And it's free to instructors. So I really uh, thank you for bringing that up. And I hope more instructors will take advantage of that. Okay. Oh, we, we do have a caller. Okay, let's see if we can successfully pipe this person in. How are you? Yes, this is Russ. Hi. Hello. What's your, what's your name, sir? Hi. Uh, it's Ben Davis. What's your name? Ben Davis. All right, Ben. Well, do you have a name for what that uh, what that beautiful airplane was in the image? It's. Uh, I'm hoping I'm right. What but is it? I think it's a beach starship. You are absolutely correct. I was waiting for somebody to say a Piaggio, but yes, that was a Beechcraft Starship. Beautiful airplane. Uh, so thank you. So uh, what we're going to do is, um, I think we're going to have you email us, Ben, at prize at onlinegroundschool.com. So that's your email address. You write it down, prize at onlinegroundschool.com. Just put in there uh, Beechcraft Starship, then give us your name and your snail mail address and your shirt size and we will get it winging its way to you next week and thanks for playing thanks okay let's see if we've let's uh let's give away another one dave what do you think shall we go for another uh, obscure airplane semi-obscure airplane okay we've lost dave's audio but i think he's all on board with this so let's go to this second airplane we're going to see if we can get someone else to call in and tell us what kind of airplane this is. Again, the, your call-in number is going to be 888. That's 888-514-1945, option three. Option three. Fourth person to call in gets a first stab at it. This is an easy one if you don't know this one. Well, I don't know what to say. All right, let's take a look at this airplane. It's got a little bit of a background. This particular one is called Glacier Girl. It's a World War II fighter. This one was dug up in Greenland about, uh, oh gosh, 15 years ago by Pat Epps and some other people in pieces and brought up out of, I don't know, 100 feet of ice and reassembled. It took them 10 years or more to put it, the thing together, but it's a beautiful airplane. It's still, it's flying now. So Glacier Girl, what kind of airplane was this? It will have a designation. It will have a letter and a number. Or also there's a, there's a, uh, there's a NATO code for it, too. I guess they didn't have NATO back then, but it does have a name. Anything that you get that identifies this airplane will do. So that airplane is the one we're waiting on. We're going to give away another T-shirt, and here's what those look like. They're awfully cool. It'll be all your friends and family will think you're the coolest thing since sliced bread. There you are. There you are. So that airplane, Glacier Girl, flies around at air shows. You probably would have seen it at Sun and Fun had we been there this year. Uh, as I said, it was brought up. It's a great story by uh, Pat Epps and Don. Um, oh, I for, uh, forgive me. I've forgotten Don's last name, but the whole group of these guys got together. A friend of mine, George Gurren, was involved uh, and brought up Glacier Girl in pieces and rebuilt this beautiful World War II airplane. So do we have any guesses on what kind of airplane this is? 888-514- 1945, option three. Boy. Okay. 
tonnage bud had we been there this year. Hey, Russ. Um, yes. A great story by and Yes. Don. Hello. What's your name? Hey, it's Rob Lenstrom in Huntsville, Alabama. How you doing, buddy? Rob, Rob, how are you doing? Yeah, don't get confused. If you're, you're listening to the feed on your computer, it's going to be different from what you hear on the phone. So don't let that disorient you. Just listen to the phone. Okay, uh, Rob, what kind, of, what kind of airplane is that? It's a given. It's That's a, a P-38 so Lightning. What is it? Yes, it is. A beautiful Lightning? example of a P-38. Yes, it is. It is a P-38 Lightning at 550 calibers in the, machine, in the uh, nose. I believe that was an L model, but I'm not positive about that. So at uh, any rate, good deal. Uh, you have the same uh, rule here. Call, uh, email us at prize at onlinegroundschool.com. Put P38L. Give us your size and your, uh, your snail mail address. And uh, send us a picture of you standing by the DC-3, and maybe we'll send you something else, too. <laughs> All right, thanks for playing. Hey, how about you? And thanks for, being <laughs> thanks for being with us today. So, uh, Dave, are you back here? I'm not sure if we still have Dave's feed. I don't know if you got the audio. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's yes, working. Yes, we oh. hear you loud and clear now. Yeah, now I got to tell you, this, this week okay. with the bandwidth has been terrible, you know. So anyway, if we can drop one more slide on there, I'll talk about it. I'll get out of your way because I know we got Steve and Patty waiting in the green room, and I don't <laughs> want to hog any more time. Um, but there is one slide there. Okay, go for the, it. VG diagram. And this is something that uh, any uh, instructor can relate to, which is most pilots fly in that one little comfort zone in the center of the envelope. And uh, if you go down there and fly with uh, Patty Wagstaff, um, you're going to fly in every corner of that envelope, and you'll learn what un, uh, loss of control recovery looks like. Um, but, you know, we're all guilty of straight and level, flying here, flying there, and we don't practice enough. So when we get back to flying, I would mention that uh, some good exercises are what we call the extended envelope exercises, which SAFE has developed. And we do turning stalls. We do all kinds of things that a pilot might encounter inadvertently while they're uh, in the air. So um, look for that extended envelope maneuvers. And uh, if you... Uh, if you ever fly with Patty Wagstaff, you'll realize there's no such thing as an unusual attitude for her. She'll fly any which way. So thank you very much, Russ. I think I'll check off so these guys can get on. And I uh, appreciate all the support you've given us this week with the show. All right. One last thing about that VG diagram. I mean, that's also a great example of something we were talking about earlier. That's not something that you necessarily visualize in graphical form when you're up practicing stalls or something in the airplane. But it's really, if you want to be a good, polished, excellent aviator, it's really necessary to understand that. And this, again, is, this is a knowledge topic. People actually do need to do this. And how do you prove that you did it? You answer questions on a written test about it. So the VG diagram, a good example. Okay, Dave, thanks for being here, being a, being a big part of this. Uh, we will talk to you again tomorrow, and thank you for that. Okay, next up we have our buddy Steve, uh, Flight Shop's Thorn. Uh, Steve is a known primarily as one of the leading U YouTube uh, uh, video producers. So, Steve, let's get you on here. There he is. There's his YouTube channel. Man, look at all the subscribers he has. Hey, Steve, how's it going? That's good, yeah. Hey, you look Hang just like there. you did. Yeah, I don't think you've moved since yesterday. Are you just still there? <laughs> nah, yeah, nobody's moving right now. My hair is slowly growing. <laughs> okay. What's <That's> happening? <laughs> I was thinking the wife might have gotten you, locked you in that room or something. <laughs> Okay, yeah, Steve, uh, your, your YouTube channel, you have described yourself as an ambassador, and I think that's probably the very best way to put it. Um, you have done something unique with video that uh, I've not seen other people do, that you have shown a lot of different training and different aircraft that you've been able to fly, and you've looked at it from a really interesting storytelling type view, and I really think that that's one of the reasons that uh, your videos, uh, people really connect with they they really enjoy it what are some of the what are some of the different airplanes you've flown so unusual ones you know obviously there's a harvard or a t6 let's keep that video running i've been pretty lucky to get a lot, a lot of opportunities from the community yeah keep that video running you don't need to look at my face <laughs> um but i want to just say like being lumped in with some of these experts that you've got me here with it's an honor um i 
I've logged my 10,000 hours as a filmmaker, not as a pilot. I'm a low time, a relatively low time pilot. I've just been very lucky to get to do a lot of things and share those experiences with the community. So it kind of became a self-fulfilling loop of awesomeness, which just is largely because of how amazing this community is. So it's really not me. I'm just the conduit. I mean, the brand is kind of based on a joke. The mustache is honestly a joke. Started off that way. And then we were like, oh, this thing is actually getting some real traction. So we kind of corporatized the logo a little bit and tried to make it fit into a serious thing because it really started off as just me sharing my debriefs and 172 just getting recurrent after a few years and not flying when I got the house and the kid and the wife all those things happened and I hadn't been flying GoPros became a thing around that time and having a teeny tiny set it and forget it camera was amazing to be able to look back at footage having started flying in the 90s just wasn't an option to be able to get a good debrief of yourself like video cameras were big and awkward back then so what started off as my personal debrief just in a 172 evolved into the Super Cub where I shared my tailwheel training right from hour zero. And at that point, I had kind of figured out how to use six cameras at a time and shoot the pedals and shoot the, the control surfaces. And I could really see when I was over controlling. And it was really amazing to apply what I was learning by reviewing my footage, almost like a military style debrief. And just sharing that vulnerably and showing people the mistakes. And I really didn't need to be cool. I thought there was enough cool pilots on YouTube. I didn't need to be one of them. So it was really just sharing that real experience of learning and growing. And yeah, I mean, to be able to say I'm now a T6 pilot is kind of surreal. Ironically, that's the only thing I'm current in right now. So it's uh, very weird to be able to have, have been there and, and gotten all those cool experiences, but it's largely because the community is a part of it. So yeah, we've done everything from the DC-3 that you invited me to uh, get some time in. Uh, lots of different Warbird type experiences. Uh, you know, I just did the extra 300 backseat checkout and trained for the sportsman routine. So I've got that video coming actually with Luke Penner, who uh, Patty is his, his mentor. So that's pretty cool to be uh, right talking right before Patty here. Um, so really, yeah, the community. And I got to fly with Julie Clark in her T-34. Uh, last before she retired so that was a real honor that that's an episode that i shared brought my daughter out to sun and fun and she got to meet julie and sort of see a female rock star in the aviation world and then i got to really see behind the scenes of how julie does her thing and how she trains and we went up and flew in her airspace and, and you know away from the air show circuit and went up and did her routine up at altitude and she showed me how she does the heart in the sky and just really it's been an honor and a privilege to be able to share so much of the aviation community Okay, let's uh, let's keep everybody motivated here by giving away some more swag. Let's go for another T-shirt. Uh, we're going to sure. put up an image of an airplane that's actually uh, kind of near and dear to you, Steve. So don't give it away. Uh, okay. We're going to show this airplane. The first person to call eight 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 five one four nineteen forty five option three. The fourth caller to do that with the correct name for this airplane is going to win a T-shirt. So let's see the picture. This is uh, an airplane that I think Steve flew this exact one. Uh, is that true, Steve? Yeah. Is this exact that model true. that you... Okay, that's the exact... Yep, so we're going to see who's, who's quick enough on the, uh, on the trigger to name that one. Now, you have trained in a, in a lot of... This is probably one of the earlier, one of the first Warbirds you got started in, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I guess it would... would um, well, it's probably newer than a Stearman, actually. I did get time in the Stearman before I got time in that airplane. Um, Okay. But that airplane sure is fun. They call it the poor man's Spitfire. And uh, I mean, I haven't flown a Spitfire, yeah, but yeah. it flies beautiful. Well, there's a transition, a military transition. Okay, there's a military transmission, a transition that people go through. Generally, they start in a primary trainer like a Stearman. Then they'll go to a basic trainer. I don't know if that particular airplane is considered a basic trainer or not, but in the U.S. fleet, it would have been something like a BT-13. And then the next thing might be an AT-6, like uh, you flew uh, Harvard in Canada. So anyway, I do believe we've got a caller. Uh, who do we have here? Listen on the phone. Don't listen on your computer. Oh, no caller, no caller. He's getting waved off here. Okay. Well, that's too bad. We're <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, we're going to continue to talk for a minute. And if somebody does call in with a name for that airplane, 888-514-1945. Or the UK variant, because there's two differences that are pretty obvious with that airplane. That particular one is the Canadian variant that we've got. 
Okay. Well, while we're waiting to see if we get somebody to call in with, a, with the correct name for that airplane, what are some other cool airplanes that you've flown that really weren't available to us mortal people? <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. It's, it's hard to even get into that conversation. There's been so many. Um, probably one of the most unique things that I've flown was a German trainer, and I'm going to lose track of the name of it. I flew it in Switzerland. Uh, I think it was a 1929. Stork? No, uh, I can't remember what it's called. It, that episode is coming. It's in the back catalog of footage, but, uh, just amazing to see how it was a 1929 model mono wing open cockpit, but it flew so beautiful and so harmonized and a lot like the airplane that you're asking people to name there, super super balanced controls just real beautiful and, and going back that long ago it's amazing how little has changed you know for fundamentally getting an airplane balanced out to really fly with stick and rudder just feeling great when you're coordinated it's just amazing so i think one thing that's been amazing that i've been able to do is fly so many types and see how fundamentally so much of it is the same uh, and then getting away from muscle memory habits, you know, reaching for the trim in the same place or whatever in a 172, if you can break out of those habits, you can really erase the muscle memory that sometimes trips people up and they need to be flying. Like to jump out of one thing you're so used to into something else can sometimes be really hard if you don't do it a lot. But when you do it a lot, and again, I don't have a lot of time. So it's not about my experience as a volume. It's just my experience as diversity has been able to take that kind of the fundamentals from all these different things and see how much of it actually is the same. And you just make a couple quick snapshots of the site picture before you take off and something different. And then you know when you're going to land what it's about to look like. And it's kind of amazing how much of it does translate. You, know, you can jump in and out of so many things and just know some numbers and then just just most of it is see the pants flying. And that, that's what I think has been the most amazing thing that I've experienced jumping in and out of so many things. And I know there's another uh, uh, airplane that's in your uh, on your bucket list, but before we get to that one, we do have a caller. Uh, if you're on the phone, listen to the phone. Don't listen to your computer. There's a lag between the two. So who do we have today on the phone? Hi, this is Ed Wishmeyer. Ed Wishmeyer. How are you, Ed? Where are you from? I'm in Savannah, Georgia. Oh, Savannah, Georgia. Not far from here. We're up here in Atlanta. So, uh, what kind of airplane was that? Oh, that airplane was a De Havilland Chipmunk. Got it. You got it. You got it. You got it. <laughs> it was a great airplane, too. Uh, that was a, a trainer, so we're going to let Steve mention that in just a minute. But at any rate, uh, the, here's your email address again, prize at onlinegroundschool.com. Just send us an email, put the word chipmunk in there, and give us your, your T-shirt size and your snail mail address and we will get you get these things out to you and thanks for get thanks for giving us a call we appreciate it oh my pleasure one little uh, trivia point though on the p38 i think yeah. that was a foxtrot model p38 f I, I you know i thought after i said an l model i thought somebody's going to come back and say no <laughs> and i'm basing that on the uh, the signature i mean the uh, symbol on the side of the airplane i believe that was an army air course uh, symbol, uh, round L, I don't know what they call it actually, emblem, uh, which would have been an earlier model. Yeah, I, I, see the, I see the red dot in the center on that image. So that would have been Army Air Corps, so you're right, that would have definitely been an earlier model when they, later on when they went to the Army Air Force, the, uh, the Air Corps red dot went away, and that's when the later models would have been. So good catch, good catch. We'll throw you, out, we'll throw you in something extra to, uh, for pointing that out. Okay, Steve, uh, you do have another airplane, another warbird that you are trying to prep yourself for by working up through these trainers. Uh, I know what it is. So what is it? Yeah. Before we get to that real quick, I did find the picture on my phone. I don't know if you can see. I'll try to get that position there, get the reflection off of it. So oh, I forgot yeah? what it's called. It's a 1929. Oops. Yeah, you got a reflection on there now. We saw it for there for a second. Um, yeah, very okay. cool. That that wing shape is very unique. It's a monoplane, 1929 model. Anyway, yeah, that was a really fun, weird thing to fly. Um, I, what I'm working toward is the Spitfire checkout. Um, my grandfather flew them, and I would like to get a proper checkout, not just a ride. So I'm working on my T6 time so I can show up prepared 
a lot of places want to see 50 hours minimum, which for most people is difficult, obviously, to get in a T6. I'm lucky to be in a position to get that. I'm mostly there now. Uh, I'm mostly counting landings as opposed to hours, so I'd have to go, go back and look at the total time in the T6, but I've exceeded 100 solo landings at this point. I'm not scared of the airplane anymore, but I still highly respect it. Uh, the T6 is, is, I mean, they call it the pilot maker. At this point, I'm... Uh, it's, it's weird to say I'm as comfortable as I was in the Super Cub only because I exceeded the time that I got in the Super Cub in the T6 now because the Super Cub, somebody prop struck it pretty early on before I had 50 hours in it. And then it went offline forever, the one that I had access to. So uh, I started flying the Chipmunks after that and uh, got a fair bit of time in them. And by the way, that the bubble canopy is the difference. That's the Canadian variant. The UK variant has the uh, greenhouse canopy, which looks more like a T6 canopy. Um, but anyways, yeah, so working on my T6 time, and I guess apparently most of the guys I've talked to that fly Mustangs and Spitfires say, if you can land the T6, especially from the back seat, if you get your back seat checkout in the T6, which is the instructor's seat, you're going to be fine in the Mustang or the Spitfire. Apparently they're easier to fly, which I guess was on purpose. The military used the T6 to kind of wash out the students. So by the time you got to the fighter, it was just easier to fly. Which I don't know, I think the biggest scary thing about the Mustang or the Spitfire is the amount of power and the P factor will roll right over if you slam the power on a go around or something like that and you're low and slow, you flip right over and die. I think that was kind of one of the scary things about the Mustang. But the training in the T6, because it's this giant radial engine, you actually can't advance the power quickly or it'll just backfire and do nothing for you. And it's just hard on the engine. So the training really is to move the power like this slow as you go to full throttle. So if you're going to do a go around, you kind of, sometimes you'll still touch the ground before you go, like in a jet where it takes a while to get the power back up. If you try to do a go around at the last minute, it, it, you can't just hammer it. So for me, and you also can't firewall it. You got to be careful. You set the manifold pressure to where you want it because you can overboost it. It's a supercharged engine and it's not full throttle at sea level to have, but well, we fly it at 32 inches. Wartime power was 36 inches manifold pressure in the T6 or maybe it's higher Americans. But anyways, we, we just stick with 32 inches just so we're kind of babying the engine a little bit, but yeah, you kind of carefully set it there and you go. So that training, I think, bringing it forward to the Mustang would make it less likely that you'd flip it over and make that mistake that I think some of the inexperienced pilots would make with the Mustang because it's, I don't know, was it 3,000 horsepower or something? The, the T6 is 600 horsepower. So it's a big, heavy airplane. It was in with the 2000s, but it was a lot. 2000, yeah. So when you, when you floor that engine, it's going to have a lot of torque in the Mustang. The, uh, the Harvard or the T6 does have that massive prop, which breaks the sound barrier. Uh, the tips, which is why it has that really unique sound when it's at full takeoff power. But uh, yeah, trying to show up prepared for an actual Spitfire checkout is is definitely my goal. I want to get in my logbook to say I'm qualified as a Spitfire pilot. That would be an awesome bucket list item. I don't need to solo it. I don't think I want that kind of pressure, but I would love to have an instructor kind of sit with his arm crossed and say, you did the whole thing. That's all you. Well, the stuff that you said was absolutely accurate from what I've heard, too. I've, uh, I've talked with Lee Lauderback about it, uh, probably the premier uh, P-51 or TF-51 uh, instructor on the planet, really. And that when these guys went up through an AT-6 uh, in the military back in the 40s, I mean, that was specifically to get them ready to step into fighters, either a P-39 or a, or a P-40 or a P-51. And they specifically made those, those T-6s or AT-6s as a transitional airplane and again i've heard this from people who know better that the the fighters the p51 is actually an easier airplane to fly than a t6 is but having all that extra torque and p factor like you say uh gets we could get people in a lot of trouble mm -hmm. there's just so much more power so absolutely true about that uh, now, Steve, one of the things that's always fascinated me about your videos is your ability to tell a story. And I, I know you're, you're, you're a very uh, humble person, but you have a real talent for this. Your videos are different from everyone else's. You, I mean, it's not just your cuts, but the way you do these asides where you go and talk to people off to the side and then you're right back into the action of the video. I believe you had some video production uh, experience prior to getting in aviation, am I correct? Oh yeah, I went to film school in the 90s and went straight into the film industry and that's kind of what I had always done. So I was a freelance filmmaker, um, got my license at the same time in film school to be a private pilot, never intended to go commercial, still don't. 
but uh, flying and filmmaking are both things that I've logged 20 hour or 20 years doing. Uh, I did my 10,000 hours, like I said, as a filmmaker, uh, not, not nearly that kind of experience as a pilot. So it's been interesting to combine the two. Um, so again, I understand to engage, you know, people, it's difficult to convey information in a nerdy kind of way and also tell a story that's engaging. So I've tried to find that balance where I guess, you know, I allow them to connect with the learning process, put them in the seat with me and share the briefings with me and intercut. So instead of like showing a whole briefing and then a whole flight, which linearly is how it would have happened in real life, I'll usually intercut the briefing with the flight, the thing that we talked about and show it happening and then show that mistake that we, I was warned about and it still happens because a lot of times you just can't get around making that mistake until you really do it, right? And but so it's interesting to see a briefing and we talk about what to watch for and then show it actually happening and intercut experts talking about the thing while it's happening. It, it, kind of the the rule, you know, picks or didn't happen is the the public way of saying it. But in filmmaking, it's see it, say it. So you know, I try not to talk about something unless I'm showing it. And if I don't have footage of it, I kind of just like. I got to get the footage or it's not really usable. Like it needs to be demonstrated in an authentic, engaging kind of way. So that's kind of been the secret sauce, I guess, just the vulnerability, the authenticity, and just, yeah, bringing in some good production values never hurts either. But honestly, there's times when I'll use footage that TV would have thrown away where it's like the camera didn't quite get there yet. It's still not in focus, but the moment is happening and I don't care. Like I want to capture it. It's good enough. By you know, landing on the shot, well, the thing of whatever I'm trying to capture is happening. And that's if I'm shooting handheld of a thing that I'm not doing, right? But most of the time it's GoPro footage locked off so I can set it and forget it and capture it if I'm actually at the controls. Um, but so the key is to not think in TV terms sometimes when production values get tossed aside if I have footage that demonstrates the thing in an engaging kind of way that really can resonate with a viewer. Do you do a, take a lot of uh, effort early on to lay your shots out and to do a lot of planning or you just go shoot a whole bunch of stuff and then bring it back in? Well, so this is the thing. I went to film school as a filmmaker where we really controlled everything. And that is my passion is to have that kind of filmmaking where it's all storyboarded and scripted. But it's been interesting how reality TV, which I started working in a lot and mostly hated, to be honest, does it in a different way where this, the producers will map out what they want to have happen and they want the drama and they're like, stay on the guy who we know is going to get mad and like get that shot when he finally gets frustrated or whatever and they fight. Um, so there will be storyboards to that degree in reality TV. And then they have 20 camera guys just on a thing, whatever show it is, just shoot all of it. And then the editors figured out later. I've applied some of that wisdom in the sense that um, I don't want to force something. So you probably have noticed the times we've worked together, you've tried to pre-interview me and I've always said, I'd rather just talk about the dog right now. I know, I think I know what you're going to ask me, but just ask me for real on camera because I'm not an actor. I don't want to try to tell the same story twice. So I don't put people in that position either. So oftentimes when I get to the place I'm going to get to start shooting something, the person is very excited about their thing and they're like, oh yeah, so it's really cool. I'm like, stop right there and tell me about your dog until I get the camera ready. I don't want to hear it because I want it to be real. Um, so with that in mind, I, I have an idea of what I think I'm going to get. And I have a pretty, you know, if I'm shooting tailwheel stuff, I'll plan to like have a camera mounted on the back, looking at the tailwheel so we can talk about wheel landings or three pointers. Like I know I, I'm going to want certain shots, but I don't know how it's going to play out. So my goal is to try to get it and then figure out the story later. So almost always my story is a bullet point when I start and then I write the essay while I'm editing. Okay, well, I know that we're going to be going back and reviewing the things you said to help us with our own production because you do a beautiful job it. of it. And I suspect there's a lot of people out there that uh, kind of hold you as the bar, the, uh, what they want to try to, to be like. Well, Steve, thanks for being with us today. Uh, earlier this week, too, we've had fun. Uh, this uh, uh, Friday, the last day of what would have been in sun and fun, it's almost like feeling like it's wrapping up. We do have one more day to go, but thank you. Uh, next, we've got Patty Wagstaff. She's been with us uh, before, <clears throat> although this is the first time this week. <clears throat> so let's see. Patty, we're going to have you. Uh, let's go ahead and bring Patty in. <coughs> Hey, how are you? Good. 
Okay. We're going to be talking today about your new aerobatics course with Sporties. Now, how, how long ago was that thing put together? When was that done? I know it's out as a new product now, but when did, were you filming all of that? Um, first of all, thanks a lot for having me today. Um, this is, it's, it was nice to have something to sit on the schedule, you know. Um, I'm used to being, I think a lot of people being so busy and, and they have the, the day completely open. It's really nice to have a little structure. Um, so the video came out in February, and but we started working on it last August. And uh, so Sporties and I. So it, it was about a six month process to do all the script and the video shooting and the graphics and, and so on. So, um, so it came out in February and we're hoping to have the next one out in a couple of months. That's awesome. Can you tell us a kind of an overview on what the objective of this video course is? Sure. You know, um, I want people to know what aerobatics is all about. I don't want them to think, oh, it's something only crazy people do or only air show pilots do or, you know, something you have to be dragged in to do kicking and screaming uh, for your CFI, you know, spin course. I want people to appreciate how fantastic aerobatics is, how it's really for everybody. And even if you are not a pilot, um, even if you don't want to fly aerobatics, how knowing something about aerobatics can help you um, in your own flying and also help you appreciate what you do see at air shows or if you ever go to an aerobatic contest. So it's really um, more informational than instructional. Um, and so my goal has always been to, to uh, get people to really appreciate what we do a little bit more. Okay, well, the photography that I've seen from it, uh, I haven't looked at the whole course yet, but I've seen a, a, a few segments of it, and, and it's amazing. So did you approach Sporties, or did they uh, approach you to put this together? Who, who came up with the concept? It had been in my mind for a long time to do something like this, but um, I, mm -hmm. you know, it's not something I could have done on my own. And, you know, when I thought, I thought about who I'd want to partner with, Sporties was the first really the number one, you know, company that came to mind. I mean, everybody knows Sporties. They're highly respected. Um, my, my first Christmas after I got my license, uh, my husband ordered all these aviation things. He was so excited that I got my license and I was flying. He ordered all these things from Sporties. He called it a Sporties Christmas. And I have a picture, you know, with a headset and some charts and a bag and, and that's all I got that. I didn't get any girly stuff. I just got, you know, um, sp stuff from Sporties. It was great. So Sporties <laughs> has been a part of my um, aviation history, you know, forever. And um, so I couldn't think of a better partner. And they've been amazing to work with, as you might expect. Yes, absolutely. I mean, they absolutely know what they're doing and they have great production uh, capability with their video work. They're they're beautiful stuff. Amazing. Did you... Did you pretty much lay out the structure of it yourself? Yeah, um, I had a vision in mind of how the structure would be, but we did discuss it ahead of time. Um, and I came up with the different segments. You know, I, I really wanted to uh, talk about the history of aerobatics. I thought that was really important. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the more fun segments on there. There's a lot of, a lot of great uh -huh. historical footage. Um, and I wanted people to understand all the basic maneuvers and then give them a few more advanced maneuvers too, so that they could, you know, see what, see what it's all about. Um, and for people who go to air shows and, and so on. Um, but it, I, I, some of the other segments like aerobatics today, you know, where do you see aerobatics? Um, military, air shows, competitions, that kind of thing. Um, aerobatic airplanes is another segment. People really are um, you know, interested in that. And it was kind of fun. I went to the aviation um, program. They have an aviation academy at the St. Augustine High School. And the um, Dr. Angela Masson invited me to speak to four classes recently. It was about a month ago or so. And um, so I brought the video, or I, or I streamed it in the classroom. And each class had a little bit different focus and what they were studying. Some of them were really into drones and some of them were into you know, the flying more and so on and so forth or aeronautical engineering. And I asked them, which, which segment do you want to see? And there was a segment for each of them that they wanted. Uh, one, one of the classes really wanted to see the segment on aerobatic airplanes. Uh, one wanted to see the maneuvers and so on and so forth. So I thought this is really cool. There's something for everybody. 
Well, it was, I'm sure it was a lot of fun to, to put together. Let's, we're going to take a look at one of the video segments, and then I want to come back and have you talk about how you set up the shots, where the cameras were, any issues you had with air to air. So let's take a look at the, uh, the segment on, on the hammerhead. The hammerhead begins with a quarter loop to establish a vertical climb. At the top of the vertical line, the aircraft pivots 180 degrees around the yaw axis with the rudder and establishes a vertical descent. The figure ends as the aircraft completes a quarter loop back to horizontal flight. This is one of my favorite maneuvers because it demands precision from the pilot to do it well. The vertical line must be perfectly vertical or else the airplane's pivot at the top will torque or twist. Look directly ahead and pick a reference on the horizon. Establish an airspeed above level cruise flight approximately 150 to 170 miles an hour. Pull back in the elevator to approximately 4 G's, and as you pull, look at the left wingtip or the sight gauge for orientation. Hold the airplane still on the vertical line. As the airplane slows to a stop, initiate full left rudder to pivot the airplane to a vertical downline. Looking at the horizon, increase back pressure on the stick until back to level flight. Okay, the panning, the panning shots from the cockpit, how was that done? So that was done um, with a, well, there were several cameras on the plane. So we had cameras on the wing, sure. cameras um, in the cockpit, outside the cockpit, there were cameras all over. And then we would, um, um, I'm not sure, I don't think that was done with 360 video, but I might be wrong. Um, the video part isn't really my forte, but I've got camera mounts all over every plane I fly. So I let other people put the cameras on and, uh, and that's what sporties did. They put all the cameras on, they have all the state of the art, you know, GoPros and so on. And, uh, um, so next time we'll have to get somebody from sporties on your show to talk about the technical aspects Yeah, and the graphics that they did. I'm, I'm a geek. I'll. I'm a geek. I love this stuff. I want to hear, you know, the nuts and bolts of what made it work. So yeah, that would be, that would be really cool. Uh, the, the, um, animation sporty says great animation. Uh, did they yeah, just do yeah. that all on their own or did you work with them on that too? Developing the animated scenes. They provided the technology and the, the, you know, the know how to do that. But, um, but I reviewed everything and there were a few maneuvers that maybe were going too fast or, you know, we had to slow certain things down. There were some minor tweaks that I had to do because I wanted everything to be perfect, of course, as did they. So, um, so we worked together on it, but they, they absolutely did the graphics. Gotcha. And John, back in the control room or in the uh, remote control room right now, see, I'm not the only one who does that. Let's take a look. Take let's take a look at your next uh, segment, and this one's on tail slides. This is something I did. Uh, I, I believe you knew Elgin Wells. Was he? A, do you remember Elgin Wells? Yes, yeah, I knew Elgin. Okay, yeah, very very good friend of mine, and uh, I always enjoyed doing tail slides with him and his super decathlon. Anyway, let's take a look at tail slides. The tail slide is a maneuver seen in advanced categories of competition and also at air shows. There are two types of tail slides one where the airplane falls backwards with wheels up, and the other where the airplane falls forwards with wheels down. Often, the nose will swing back or pendulum past the vertical after falling through. A very fun maneuver, but you gotta really hold on to the stick, don't you? Yeah, that's why they call them whip stalls, because they whip the stick out of your hand <laughs> if, you, if you get a really good tail slide. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I had that, I've had that happen and I got uh, verbally admonished for doing so. Well, Patty, thanks again. <laughs> thanks so much for doing this today. This has been a great look at your course. Let's again pop Thank up that know. screen so people can see where, where to go look at it. Let's, let's see that slate uh, with the course on there and the course material. There it is. So go to sporties.com slash aerobatics and check this thing out. It's, uh, it's something I think you'll really enjoy. So, Patty, thank you again. We will be talking again soon. Maybe we'll try to get you back on here uh, in a few more weeks. Thank so, you so uh, much. She's Rob. a great person. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, I strongly recommend that you take a look at this new video course, course from Sporties. Well, okay, that's a wrap for today. Tomorrow, Tom Turner will be aboard and we'll be graced again by Aviators Anonymous. 
Brian Turner, Josh Flowers, and Spencer Suderman. So keep your head in the clouds, fly smart, and show everyone that you're a Gold Seal pilot. So long. This webinar is brought to you by SAFE and the Gold Seal Online Ground School, where instructors join for free. Visit Gold Seal at onlinegroundschool.com.